All right. So my name is Zach Shriakonti, and I'm a research associate at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Um, and I would also like to introduce my colleagues and co-organizers of the seminar series. So there's Andrea Pizzaferrato, who is an assistant professor at the University of Bath, and David Masagur, who is a PhD enrichment student also at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with, with this institute, um, the Turing, as we call it, is UK's National Institute for Data Science and, and AI. Uh, and for the benefit of those joining us for the first time, I'll briefly introduce the topic of the seminar series, that is physics enhanced machine learning, with particular specific on focus on applications for engineering um, domains. Uh, physics enhanced machine learning, as most of you probably know, is, is kind of like an upcoming subfield in machine learning and deep learning that aims uh, to introduce known physical understanding um, of observed phenomenon into the machine learning frameworks. So on a side note, if any of you are keen to share your work in any of our upcoming seminars, please please do get in touch with us. Um, we'd, be, we'd be happy to sort of communicate with you and, and find a slot for your talk. As for the format of this seminar, uh, Christian will talk about for about 45 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session and discussion, uh, which you may do so through the chat or you may ask also in person. So without further ado, I'll ask my colleague Andrea to introduce our speaker for today. And with that, I thank you all. Exactly. Thank you, Zach. So um, hello, everyone. So as Zach said, my, my name is Andrea, and uh, I will now introduce our speaker, uh, Christian Axenier. So after earning a PhD in uh, neuroscience and robotics from the Technical University of Munich in 2016, Dr. Axenier spent one more year with the TUM Center of Competence Neural Engineering as a research fellow before joining Huawei Research Center in Munich. Since 2017, Dr. Axenier is staff research engineer in AI and machine learning with the Intelligent Cloud Technologies Laboratory. At the same time, Dr. Axenier is a lecturer in AI and machine learning at Technical University of Ingolstadt, where he also leads the Audi Confucius Institute Ingolstadt Lab, a Sino-German research initiative focused on combining modern AI and VR technology for applications ranging from sports technology to biomedical engineering. And without further ado, uh, Christian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank oh, you. Thanks. thanks, Andrea, grazie. So as Andrea mentioned, we look at with my academic hat, we look at biomedical applications. So today, the focus of the seminar, we'll be looking at how we can we combine knowledge that we have from biophysics or basically like uh, medical data and machine learning for a field which is as well emerging right now as along with the physics info machine learning, which is called computational oncology. Or moreover, how can we use math and machine learning or algorithms to, to make sure that we can improve therapies or improve patient outcome. And instead of going through a typical lecture today, like a introducing computational oncology and so on, I'll first introduce a framework which we developed in, in, in Audi Confucius lab, and then I'll give you some sample applications. So I will not spend too much time in what computational oncology or will not go too deep into medical aspects, but we'll just scratch the surface with some applications of, of uh, biophysics informed machine learning in certain aspects of oncology. And as you even read from, my, uh, from the title of my talk today, we'll look at how can we combine physics or physical laws or biophysics with machine learning to tackle or to describe two more kinetics and even therapy outcome prediction. And instead of, as mentioned, in, in the first part of the talk, I'll introduce a math like a framework. Basically, there we go in the core of the machine learning part and how physics comes into play. And then we'll look at five instantiations, which in our case, they have names, which each one of them tackles a certain aspect or a certain problem in computational oncology. An important aspect to say, which I think I skipped, is all this work was done together with our partners at Helios Clinic, Munich West. Basically, we have close oncology departments where we test our hypothesis, and we usually get data to be able to test the hypothesis and our models on. And I will just directly dive in this framework we developed in the last years, basically a framework for 
mathematical and computational oncology, and we call it interacting computational maps. And you'll see many, many things that you typically learn in the basic machine learning courses in the university. And we'll actually demonstrate that combining such algorithms will be able to provide a tool, a framework, which is really useful for different problems in, in oncology, in clinical oncology. And now let's look directly, let's jump into the model or like the basic idea of this framework we're proposing. So now there's no medicine, there's no biophysics, there's nothing, it's just pure machine learning or at least uh, kind of the typical things we, we learn in the basics. So let's, let's set a problem. So let's set the problem of unsupervised learning. Basically we have some Un, or we have some hidden data or like have some hidden relation, mathematical relation between data coming from two sensors. In the simplest case, as we have here in our slide, we take an embedded relation, which is a power law. It's a power law three. Basically, sensor two values are given by the power law of sensor one values. Additionally, what I depicted here, we have the data distribution. In our case, this is the uniform distribution, normal distribution for sensor one. And basically, if you look at the peculiarities of our hidden relation, basically we'll have such a distribution for the sensor two. It's a power loss, so all the values will be concentrated along uh, along the center, like to be a center distribution, in our case, a Gaussian, pretty steep one. And the basic idea of the framework is to find pairwise correlation, or in our case, to extract such mathematical or physical relations between the quantities depicting a certain scenario in oncology in our case. But again, focusing on the same basic architecture, assuming we have a time series data yeah, from sensor one and a time series data from sensor two. What we do in our uh, framework, we basically represent this time series in a different like high level representations such that we can extract such temporal correlation or temporal variation among our sensors. And in the simplest instantiation, which I will talk today, we have this representation given by a self-organizing map. We all know what self-organizing maps are. So basically a supervised learning machine which can find structure in the data. Basically you'll have a representation which similar points or close points in your input space will be also close in the latent representation space. And this brings advantages because we will see then if we couple to such representation, this SOM1 responding to sensor one with SOM2 responding to sensor two, basically if we plug them together and connect them, given this activity pattern, or maybe in other words, this uh, competition among the neurons to represent the input space, Basically, you can extrapolate or can use that such that we can find the temporal correlation among the samples coming from the two sensors. And to visualize this a bit, basically imagine that we have a 1D SOM, basically a 1D self-organizing map, a bunch of neurons which are basically active when the value in the input from the time series is close to what the preferred value of the neuron is. This is a typical thing in self-organizing maps. Yeah, but right now we have only one line of data. So it's a 1D SOM. The other, two, the other sensor, sensor two is also represented by a similar uh, network. And what happens is that given the sample from the two sensors, sensor one sample, sensor two sample, what happens is that one of the neurons will be the most active. So basically the weight, the input weight for that neuron will be enhanced. And given the fact that we looked at a winner take all, network. Basically, one neuron will be active and the other ones will be decaying activity with distance increasing from the most active neuron. We'll be able to project that on this, this cross or like this uh, connection matrix between the self-organizing map. In, in other words, basically you project which neuron is the most active in both, new, in both input networks and then you increase the weight between those neurons in your uh, connection matrix. So now this mechanism to increase this strength between the co-active neurons in the two populations, it's, it's using Hebbian learning. Well, well, we learn from neuroscience who wires together, fires together, basically those neurons which are active at the same time strengthen the connection. This is basically the same principle here. So those neurons which are active in our, rep, in our latent space provided by the self-organizing map, we'll just have a stronger connection weight also in the Hebbian matrix or in the cross model um, matrix. 
And this is the whole idea. So basically we have different data coming from different sources, but the fact that we have time or we have this a temporal spacing of the data helps us to learn the temporal correlation. Basically, if the data comes at the same time, then basically if the neurons are responding to those values, the connection strength will be, will be strengthened. So as you see, the model is pretty simple, but of course, learning such relations is something which might not seem like so, so, so useful, but check this out. If we look at the model, if you want details, I'll just skip briefly through this because this is basically what I said in words in more like uh, mathematical, basically having the most active neurons activation and then you check which is the highest activation. You look in the other network and you strengthen the connection wave between neurons connected to each other. This is an all to all matrix between all neurons in, in, the, uh, in, in the first self-organizing map and the neurons in the second self-organizing map. So this is a, actually a look inside the, the, um, the network. You will find it in the slides for more details, but now not going too, too far away from what I said, basically we have a machine which can learn correlations about different from uh, among different senses and now showing you what the actual net the, the network actually does well this is what the network learns from the data keep in mind that the network only received samples from the two distributions without actually having any prior knowledge about the embedded relation so this relation is hidden in the data if you want a simple example, you just put this, you generate a vector, I don't know, drawn from a normal distribution or a uniform distribution, and then you just actually calculate the power law. And then you have the two data sets and you feed it to the network. And this is what the output of the network is. This is what the network learns. So this is what we have in this weight matrix we shown previously in, uh, here, the co-activation matrix. And as you can imagine, if the sample are coming continuously, basically you will have such a, such a relation learned in time, but of course the connection strength will decay in time because basically new samples are coming and maybe the same neuron will be active again. So what we wanna emphasize here is that basically we can learn the underlying nonlinear relation, which is hidden in the data between the two senses. And at the same time, we can also learn the distribution because we wanna avoid spurious uh, correlations among the two uh, the two sensors. So basically what we will do, it will encode the distribution of your data. So basically we'll be able to encode such an input distribution here with using this, this uh, tuning curves. Basically, as I mentioned in self-organizing map, each one has a preferred value. We extrapolate a bit and we'll look at having the preferred value but with a certain distribution around that value. So basically, given the fact that I will feed samples from these distributions, I'll also be able to learn through the network, the distribution encoded in the density and width of these Gaussians, which are basically representing each of the neurons. Here we have like at least five neurons and showing which of the neurons where the values actually fall or, or the preferred values of the neurons are. And be, this being said, this is actually the core uh, uh, idea of the framework we're using for, for, the, for the oncology task. Of course, if you want to look more, more into details, yeah, we can learn arbitrary nonlinear relation or linear relation and arbitrary distribution. So basically you can see here a parabola, so a second law, second order power law or a sine wave, so periodic signal. So you can learn arbitrary relations among, uh, among data sources. And now, if we want to look into like multiple relations in the same network, as I, as I shown up to now, we only have pairs of sensors. Yeah, sensor one and sensor two, sensor two and three, three and one. And you can have arbitrary relations. What the network does or what the, the system, the framework does is to plug together all these new, all these sensory data sources and basically independent of what the relation among them is, the network will bring them, bring them into agreement. So it's a bit like a constraint satisfaction network where you actually have push and pull between the quantities that you feed in the network, but the network will learn to self-organize in a, in a point in which the relations are fulfilled. Yeah. As you see, I avoid saying optimally fulfilled, optimally fulfilled, because depending on the constraint you have for a nonlinear function, linear function, you'll actually see that 
as you see it here, the input data with black and the decoded relation with, 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 with the true cause, basically you see like it follows the trend, but it's not a perfect reproduction. So I will not look at the RMAC to see how good I'm reproducing, but I'm actually looking at the distribution of the data if I actually reproduce it well, and if I'm able to extract almost, or at least in, in average, the correct value out of the network, because the network will store the learned content in such weight matrices. But this is the whole idea. So we have a framework which can learn arbitrary relations between different data sources. And you'll see in a second that we can use such properties of the system or of the network in order to do denoising, assuming that you have learned the correct relation. When one of the sensors, assuming S1 or S2 in this case, is noisy, given the fact you learned the correct relation, if one of the sources is noisy, you'll be able to do denoising because you see there's a difference between where the point actually falls on the function and what the, where the function is. Is. So we'll be able to correct that. At the same time, you can do data fusion because basically you, given the law that you actually learn, the mathematical relation, then they, they, they actually can pull the sensory value to the correct value or to the physically plausible value and fuse the data to some, uh, uh, to get a better uh, estimate of the quantity you want to measure. And the framework offers such a platform. So I wanted to choose just simple example for us to get on the same understanding of what the framework can do. And now we'll just go directly to the main, uh, main topic for today is how can we apply such a framework to uh, mathematical or computational oncology? And in the first example, in first instantiation of our framework, we'll look at how can we learn the growth patterns of cancer? Basically, we, cancer has some dynamics and we want to or like you want to learn from the data to predict how a certain tumor will evolve. So what I've shown you till now was basically interpolation. So it's regression. I show you how I can learn a function, unknown or a hidden function within the data. What I will show you right now is basically also the next step is how can I extrapolate for that to predict where the system will actually go. And what, what is specific for tumor data is the fact that you have typically small data. So no big data here because typically measurements are expensive to take and you don't have evenly sampled data. So this is why the X axis or the abscissa is not necessarily a uniformly timed uh, time series because you might have unevenly sampled data. It has high variability and I'll show you in a second what I mean. It's heterogeneous because data can come from different uh, sources and using a model to characterize this growth curves is really hard. And the core point is, models which depict or predict tumor growth are fundamental to treatments. Yeah? And this is exactly what I wanted to, to show you is the fact that we have, for example, tumor growth values. So basically how a tumor grows in days. And you see, it's, a, it's, it's like partially linear, but when you look at the log, basically you'll see that the, the growth is pretty non-linear. Yeah? And the thing is, this is just typical for, for example, for this type of tumor. But what I wanted to demonstrate is that there's a high variability, the data is unevenly sampled and the choosing, a, and the data is small, yeah? And choosing a model to characterize that is pretty hard. And to, to actually demonstrate that, there's a jungle of models, yeah, for tumor growth, yeah? We have different models, each one capturing a certain dynamics. And I just, pull out here four of the typical models used for tumor growth in oncology. And you see that the actual tumor growth function depends on parameters such as the cell population size, because basically this will grow in time, the growth rate, so the, the temporal dynamics, growth rate, cell death rate, because we talk about biological, uh, biological systems there we have different uh, time costs and different constants, which actually are important for the overall dynamics. And then other, other parameters. And as you see, everything is typically described by, by high or like nonlinear differential equations. Yeah? And basically choosing which model describes the better a certain tumor for a certain patient is pretty hard. Patient is pretty hard. And this is why we thought that, oh, why not choosing this model? Like I can actually learn the relations hidden in the time series data I have available for tumor growth or previously acquired tumor growth data and actually make predictions on where this will go. And this is what we've done. 
So basically we got input data, basically the number of cells. So we had the time series of the number of cells evolution. And then we have the measurement index, basically not like time in one to N and like evenly sampled, but basically when it was sampled. So uh, this the uneven sampling of the data because the people measure every like 10 days, then the 14 days and 27 days. So it's unevenly sampled. Again, the relation is hidden. I give a simple an example here because this is close to what I showed you before, just to make a connection, how two more growth data can be brought in the framework. And again, the principle is the same. We feed data from the measurement index and we feed data from the number of cells evolution and we try to see how they actually covariate. And this covariance pattern will be learned in this heavy and weight matrix. Well, now comes to the actual point where we bring the data in. So what we have here is data coming from different sources. So we have fluorescence imaging, we have digital caliper and then have microscopy. And you'll ask Christian, but like, these are different modalities. How do you fit it into your network? As a side note, the network that I showed you in the first part also can also work with images. We have a different uh, uh, work looking at images and processing actual direct frame from a camera. But now I'll just mention that this data was transformed in time series because we talked about uh, time series at the beginning. I wanted to keep it simple. So basically right now, even if there are different modalities, we just transform everything in, in, in time series. So we have like seven data points from imaging from a certain type of cancer for the breast cancer, because I also tried to, to show you the variability of cancer, basically to show that independent of the type of cancer, because each cancer has a different growth rate, a different model describes the dynamics. I wanted to show you that independent of the type of cancer, independent of the number of data points and the frequency of measuring the size of the tumor, we can still, a, we, can, we are still able to extract this, this function. And, in order to evaluate, we looked at some uh, typical um, metrics for time series, but also like goodness of fit, like information criteria in, in, in terms of how good the, 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 uh, the information content is, is, is extracted. And again, in our evaluation, we looked at the number of measurements, the standard deviation of the data and the number of parameters of the model, because for the goodness of fit, this is actually pretty relevant and also comparing with other models. Yeah. And uh, this is basically uh, an overview of how the, the model, in this case called Gluck, which is in German uh, translation called Luck. And we see that the, 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 act the system actually is the closest to the, to the real world data. So it's basically able to, to learn the underlying relation in the data for the different types of cancers we have at hand. So we have the breast cancer, two different cell lines. So basically two different uh, cancer types, depending on how, like the, the tumor growth and their specifics, and then also two other organs. Yeah, so we have lung cancer and leukemia, so blood, the, the blood cancer, basically. And we saw that the the model is actually the closest to to the real world data. So it was a, actually able to interpolate and learn the relation, or like learn the tumor growth curve, and. For those uh, number geeks, you have here also a ranking depending on the, the number of, of, of metrics you looked at. And basically the model, of course, the other models I compare with here, as you also saw, they are like static differential equations models. You will say, Christian, but this is not necessarily fair because those are static models, but those models are actually coming from experimental work. So those guys actually looked at Petri dishes with cancer and measured and actually came up with the model. In our case, we don't put any prior information but rather let the system learn the physics of or like the relation among the, phys the, the different quantities and then be able to actually come with a curve which is actually pretty similar. And, uh, sorry, and, and we were able using in this case like machine learning to overcome the deficiencies or like the limitations that each of the models only capture a certain part of the dynamics of the tumor growth. And the next step was, okay, but this is one thing, we can learn how the, the tumor grows, but the tumors during their life, they go through different states. Yeah? So you'll see that at the beginning, there's like a, a phase of accumulation, there's a phase of quietness, then the, the cells actually are there, but they don't proliferate. And there's also a case in which uh, there's the necrosis. So basically because of lack of nutrients, the actual cells will die. And this is a bit of like uh, medical terms for you to, to actually understand the next application, which is 
understanding how a tumor changes state in time. And I'll just go to, to, to some li limited uh, um, state space, let's go this way. And where basically states can, or like cells can go from quiescence, so silent, they don't proliferate to proliferative state or to apoptosis, which is programmed cell death basically. And this happens in, in low level. So you have genetics involved. They have a lot of, a lot of biophysics they're involved. But the main idea is that can we use such a machine learning system to learn the transitions between, um, uh, between the phases of the tumor? In this case, we wanted to see if we can combine immunohistochemistry data and morphometric data of a tumor. And basically, even simpler, we strip, strip, strip details until we come up to the point in which can I learn such nonlinear relation between the data I have available? Yeah. So again, we have the biophysics, which tell us the okay, case cells switch uh, states from here to there, but we also have the machine learning capable of crunching the data, characterizing each of the state, be able to extract such nonlinear relations. And again, um, what I show you here is basically what the actual system done uh, there. So we, we have, in our case, data coming from time series of immunohistochemistry and morphometric data. What, what is, are the time series themselves? Are basically these indices, AI, PI, which is proliferation index and apoptosis index. And the transitions, this alpha P um, and alpha A are basically the mathematical relations showing where is the threshold for a cell to switch from quiescent to proliferative, or from quiescent to apoptotic. So basically based on this, on these indices, AI and PI, which are in our case, the time series, where we can learn the, the, um, the transitions or the values of this A alpha P and alpha A in time, basically describing the quiescent to proliferation transition and the quiescent to apoptotic transition. And as you see here, this is the, 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 the circles are the actual relation from the data. So just fitting the data. And then you see with, with the, the black points, the learned relation, which kind of approximates the, 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 um, the transitions, but you see there are like also huge differences, at least in this part at the beginning where our system actually goes and like makes it uh, quasi linear. Yeah? So you'll see there are at like small levels of uh, or like the low levels of proliferative index and apoptotic index, the system has troubles basically at the boundaries. So I don't go into details. There are boundary conditions to, to obey in such a system, which I've shown at the beginning, but I'll not go into details. So basically these are boundary effects, which we, we, we encounter. Um, okay, so we can characterize how a tumor grows. We can characterize how it changes uh, a state, but can we use again, the same system in, in trying to help us to plan surgery or chemotherapy. And in this instantiation of the framework, we looked at how can we combine mechanistic models and the framework I've shown you to sequence what to do first, chemotherapy and then surgery or surgery and then chemotherapy. In, in medical terms, neoadjuvant therapy before surgery or adjuvant therapy when you do chemotherapy or basically giving drugs after the surgery. And this is a bit of formalism here because basically here we have a tumor growth model that we discussed at the beginning, or maybe basically the curve. And then we have the, me, me, the drugs. So me, drugs are described by pharmacokinetics. So basically how do the temporal dynamics of the drug react in the body of the patient? And these models come together to be able to de describe the actual growth of the tumor. So basically the volume of the tumor is dependent on how the tumor grows and the impact that the drug has upon the tumor. Yeah, because you expect that when you administer the drug, the, the tumor will decrease in time. In the adjuvant setting, this is what we do. We consider like an exponential, like a exponential growth law for the, for the tumor. And then basically what we wanna do is to learn the function F and the function P describing the drug effect on the tumor. And in the neoadjuvant setting, I will not go through the details too much, but like, again, you have the slides, if you wanna crunch the math. In the neoadjuvant, basically right now, what we have is, is the same thing, rather that 
In the new adjuvant, we apply the, the, the chemotherapy before, and then we operate the smaller, hopefully smaller tumor. So basically, it will always be the case that we look at, at the tumor which grows without drugs, which is basically a different uh, growth law, and the tumor which grows under drug effect, which is the second sequence to the new adjuvant. And the system helped us basically by learning the growth model and the pharmacokinetics of the drug administered, how, what, what's better for a certain patient, to do surgery first or to do chemotherapy first, yeah? And uh, basically what, oh, sorry. What we have here is again, the same type of, of models. I'll, I'll just go briefly. But what's interesting is that right now, we look at breast cancer because our partners, clinical partners work more in breast cancer. We look at a typical uh, drug that's typically administered for, for, uh, uh, for breast cancer, which is paclitaxel. And basically you go there, take the, the, chemical, the chemical formulation, and then you get the actual um, pharmacokinetics. So basically the equations on how the processes Get generated by the drug inside the body, the uptake, the binding, the efflux actually look like, and you try to learn that. Yeah? So we provide data for the concentration inside the cell. We have the, the different, for example, the initial cell number, we have uh, constants for drug binding, for drug efflux and so on. And we fit everything in our model such that we are able to learn the pharmacokinetics. And the cool part is that with such a model that I showed you earlier, we are basically able to learn both the tumor growth, which I shown at the beginning. So what you see here, again, we have different types of breast cancer, so at different cell lines. Again, cell lines are typically what you do uh, experiments in a petri dish. So you have different type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, cancer types. In our area, cell lines, and each one reacts differently to a certain therapy. Yeah? And basically, what I show you here is that the system is able, the system that we provide, the framework that we provide, is capable of actually getting uh, or of capturing the data points. You see, actually goes and fits these inflections, whereas the other mechanistic models typically use, they don't capture that because each one is tuned towards a certain range of variation of the data, whereas the machine learning framework I depicted before is actually able to capture that. And for example, the, the last data set here is basically one where we apply therapy and we actually see that the other models, they don't actually capture the fact that suddenly the, the, the tumor volume decreased after the effect of therapy and the system that we propose actually captures this down, the steep down uh, going uh, trend. And this is just for the tumor growth. At the same time, because we also demonstrated that we can also learn the pharmacokinetics, basically what you have in these two, two graphs is the drug concentration of the intracellular and extracellular. Basically, again, we're able to learn the function describing the, the drug dynamics within the, uh, the cell line. Yeah? Basically, each, line, each cell line uh, reacts differently and each drug acts differently. But with this system that I showed you, I can learn also the pharmacokinetics. So basically feed the time series of how the, 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 um, the tumor changed and the different parameters of each drug. And then you can get such a nice fit. And now um, basically we also look at the specific uh, cell line, the one that I showed you where we apply the, 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 um, the drug. And what I wanted to show you here without going too much into details that I was like the system was able to provide what's the best hypothesis or like what's the best approach. The fact that you'll have a smaller volume of the tumor in neoadjuvant or in adjuvant therapy. And I show that here, we, our system pre predicted that if you follow the, the log kill hypothesis, so basically there are two hypotheses. Uh, hypothesizing how the actual tumor grows. And the system was able to detect the, the actual two options depending on the hypothesis you apply for the two cases without having many parameters or biological parameters tuned with respect to, for example, models like Gompertz model, a tumor growth model, which have at least three parameters tuned. 
And this was the, 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 the selling point. Basically, you can do or you can actually extract insights on how to parameterize your therapy based on the data itself. So basically, you are able to learn two more growth curves and pharmacokinetics to, imp to infer what's the best sequence of therapy, which is consistent with the mechanistic counterparts with the differential equations model, like the Gompertz model, but without biological parametrization. So basically, you don't have to bring any, any like carrying capacities and so on in the model. And like the last application is basically now at the other end of the spectrum, we're looking at how can we predict therapy outcomes. And basically, again, the context is this. So when we choose a chemotherapy regimen, you look at empirical data from clinical trials and there are national guidelines on how to administer therapy. And this depends of course on the form and subtype of cancer. Yeah? And again, it depends also on the progression to metastasis. So basically each of the cancers has different metastasis points and the progression is actually really relevant in how to administer the therapy on. And there are high risk indications because as you know, therapy kills the tumors, but also kills good cells yeah? because you cannot have like directly targeted therapy through chemotherapy alone. And basically what happens, you have like high levels of toxicity in the patients. And uh, basically, prognosis is actually something really relevant because then we can actually predict how the disease or uh, uh, the residual disease will develop in the patient. And typically, you have algorithms, this is how they call it in the uh, national norms, where it's like, okay, if the tumor is bigger than two centimeters and you have some biomarkers which are describing the tumor for a person, for a specific patient, and it's an inflammatory state and so on, then you apply the neoadjuvant therapy. Basically, you apply chemotherapy before operation. This means neoadjuvant. And then you have a uh, branching of, um, of options, of rules, basically this designing these guidelines. And what I uh, pulled out here is a typical guideline that you apply for a certain patient with breast cancer with a tumor, which is bigger than two centimeters. And what happens is that basically we cannot predict at the moment how effective this regimen that you have here ex exemplified on the right uh, before applying it. Because again, applying chemotherapy kills tumor but also brings high levels of toxicity. But we cannot estimate how much of a certain tumor will actually kill or if it will be like total recession of the tumor. Yeah? And basically this, we, we applied our framework to be able to, or like to e explore if we're able to predict such, such uh, effectiveness. And basically what we have here is in the upper part, you have the dose rate, basically how, when we apply our dose of drug and in the lower part, just like to have a visual impact, basically you have the, with, with, with yellow, you have the tumor response, uh, basically when you have a really sensitive tumor, Basically, you see the tumor grows, and then when you apply the dose, it goes down, and tumor grows again in between the dose, and it goes down when you apply the dose. So basically, it's as you see, it's more like a reactive system, basically. Yeah, but you also have like more resistant tumors, and as you see with blue here, the tumor actually has a, a decreasing trend when you apply the the the, um, the therapy. But you see the the changes are not that large. When, when you actually stop the application, or like the administering doses, and then the tumor grows indifferently. And you see, these are typical growth laws, which are captured by the exponential models I showed at the beginning, this Gompertz law, for example. So basically, we want to estimate like what will be the outcome of, of administering a certain therapy with a certain drug. And again, we saw this basically, for example, in, in our case, we will see this a lot. So we have uh, an input data, we have the fraction of cell kill as a one-time series. And then we have like the radius of cell kill, like the two parameters actually describing, and I'll show you in a second, uh, uh, this outcome. And then you have like the tumor response data. Basically you have like this uh, growth, but it's like a bit slower growth of, um, of, uh, of the tumor, which is basically hidden in the data of fraction cell kill, radius cell kill. Again, the same system, we apply the time series, you have the two latent spaces and we try to learn the correlations, basically extracting this tumor growth. And again, now if you look at the actual data we fit in, we have this unperturbed tumor growth, basically the, the raw cell lines we saw before. Again, 
you see the data points are different, the frequency is different. And uh, what we have here, for example, again, is the tumor growth learning. This is unperturbed, basically tumor growth without applying chemotherapy. And we see that our system is actually pretty good at, at learning that. And what we wanna actually see is this tumor growth and the outcome in this data set, we have tumor growth, and then suddenly we start administering chemotherapy, and basically the system actually sees that there's like a decreasing trend. And basically what you see here is the decrease in, in the mean decrease of the volume of the tumor uh, in a certain regimen. This is actual real data, yeah, what we have here. This, this data comes from this, this trial here. This is actual real world data. And we are pretty happy because we're able to actually see that like, given the number of patients we had, we actually saw that the, the, um, the system were, was able to, to find or like to, to learn the fact that the mean volume decreases with a certain, a certain trend in, in this data set. And um, I think I will stop here because I basically covered the, the entire time I had allocated. And I just wanted with this presentation to give you a bit of a glimpse on how can we combine this knowledge we have about like the physics of the cells, like basically these growth curves and the knowledge we have about uh, uh, drugs to be able to actually schedule therapies and at the same time also, also predict outcomes of, of such therapies in, in, in uh, oncology. Um, and thanks for your, for your attention and open for questions right now. Thank you so much, Christian. It was very intriguing. And uh, as always, thank you for your very clear explanation. Um, <clears throat> um, do we have any questions? If you do, feel free to type them in the comment box or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. In the meantime, I was wondering, uh, oh, we have a question from David. David, go, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Zach, and uh, thank you, Christian, um, for your presentation. Um, it's been very interesting. Actually, your um, the model you were describing here is uh, actually the correl correlation model is uh, very interesting. But I actually was wondering, this oh, okay? You have been showing diff, uh, many applications here, but they are all uh, like two D applications, aren't they? Yeah. I was trying to imagine, to imagine, you mentioned that this can be applied to images. So does this mean you imply that this can be applied to more than 2D? Um, yeah, I, um, I would say this is, the, this is the, thanks David. I would say this is a topic for another talk where okay. I can show how this framework can be applied also for visual. And I'll give you just a glimpse. So basically we had a similar network in which we fed uh, visual data and we're able to extract or like to learn relations for computing optical flow, spatial gradient, temporal gradient. So as you said, this is 2D, but this can go also more D basically having input as frames from a camera and calculating like this, this quantities like uh, optic flow, spatial gradient, like whatever Sobel derivative you wanna, we wanna calculate. But I'll point yeah. you if you want, we can keep chat or like we can, talk to two of us and I point you to a paper on archive, which actually <laughs> applies the same principle for, for images. And you can learn, again, you, can, you don't learn the tumor growth, but you learn um, optic flow, for example, or spatial gradient. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you have, again, a set, uh, you have a network of the different quantities and they all interact with each other to learn consistently these quantities, yes. Okay, sounds like maybe you can volunteer for a, for a third seminar then. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. We do, we do vision as well, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, Christian. Let's see if anyone else. Sure. Um, I, I have a question. question. If nobody else has a question. Um, I was wondering if you can, so from your framework, if you can extract a kind of like dynamic operator, like similar to kind of like a coupon operator from this, um, because I see that, you, yeah, I mean, you have this kind of like it's still is it I, I cannot really call it a black box but i was wondering if you can extract from it a kind of you know like in, when you extract a linear operator in dynamic systems yeah uh, I, I know i'm familiar with cindy myself and with with yeah. brunton's work yeah, yeah and, uh, steve brunton's work in in washington and um 
I would say at the moment, the network, or at least the basic, like the first instantiation of the system, as you saw with the self-organizing map and heavy learning, it's still static. So it doesn't have the temporal dimension into basically a learn equipment operator. Yeah, You see that I feed time series and then I learn a static relation. But this can be done because basically instead of like, okay, instead of having this self-organizing map, we can have a different Latin space representation. Yeah? Yeah. So I just put this as even forget about self-organizing map, just take it as a winner take all circuit, soft or hard, basically. You have like a, a Latin space representation can be 2D, 1D, whatever. And the heavy learning, well, heavy learning again, it was in this case, looking at just the temporal correlation, but you can add a second dimension where you can actually go and evolve this this uh, this static relation actually extracts something which is similar to the Koopman operator yeah for for the uh, system identification yeah I think that's type of work um it because it, it also sort of reminded me of temporal um, delay embedding yeah uh, um, this kind of sorry tokens or tokens delay embedding um, yeah I see there's a, there would be a lot of value also in this kind of application but thank thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. But this is, again, it's a simple implementation, but the framework, the principle is the same, basically. Yeah. So you want to represent or bring the data in a representation where you can extract the temporal correlation. If you want to keep a static or an evolving relation, it's up to you, but then you have to change a bit the mechanisms. What was it, What was intriguing in your, in your case is that you also kind of like, um, your system is, your approach is not sensitive to, you know, the sampling invariance and the, uh, the, uh, um, various other kind of noise that you normally find in this kind of data. But why? Because basically you bring everything in this uh, Latin space, yeah. which if you have it like uh, arbitrarily large, then you have a really fine resolution. Each of your neurons will be tuned to a certain space, like placed in your input space. And again, this doesn't only apply to time series, which they usually have, like okay, you can find a data distribution, but also applies to images, but then suddenly have a 2D Latin yeah. space. Yeah, and you have like something which is closer to the data representation space itself. Thank you, Christian. Sure. We have one question. Can you share to all the vision paper? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll just like share it. I'll stop uh, my share screen, uh, screen sharing and then I'll paste it in the chat. Yeah? Yes, that, that would work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Because um, then I, I can pull it out. Just to let everybody know that the slides from each talk um, are always uploaded to the website. So you can always have a look at them um, on the website. And the link to the website is in the email sent to you um, with the calendar invite. Yeah. And just right. come back to the authors when you have questions, if you find something. Yeah. That's kind. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I just paste it right now. All right. Okay, you have it. Brilliant. Right. So, if there are no pressing questions, then we maybe can can wrap it up. Awesome. Uh, thank you once again, Christian, for sure. contributing to the to the seminar, and potentially <laughs> maybe hearing from you again. Well, I don't know. Let's see, because I saw the slots are uh, filling in rapidly, so we see each other maybe in fall or something. <laughs> yes. yes, but I mean, uh, obviously you're welcome to, to join. And now that you're also in the list, you will receive the, the notifications. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I, I, I will, maybe. I will prepare a bit of, of things on, the, on vision and this inver learning of invariances, and then, yeah, why not? Cool. All right, thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And um, we hope to see you in the next um, seminar. Um, and for, again, for more information, please visit the website. All yep. right, good day, guys. Have a good one. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Christian. Sure. Much appreciated. Bye -bye. Yeah, always. Pleasure.